Welcome to Rich Your Soul, Kent Lewis. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. And I am excited for the conversation. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? So I was, um, I will say that growing up in Seattle, Washington, that I realized that uh, unlike my wife who's from the East Coast, where people judge you based on your last name, is it ethnic or not? Or is it a known famous name, Vanderbilt or whatever? Um, or based on your what your parents do for a living? I didn't have any of that. I'm Pacific Northwest. Everybody has a weird name. Um, my dad was an architect, which means people thought he made more money than he did. He didn't run his own firm, so he never really made that much money. And my mom was in nonprofits, and she actually made good money, but nobody knew what that means. So I grew up in middle class um, with hardworking parents, but I didn't know where I was. But the one thing they instilled in me from childhood was you can't count on this thing called child, um, social security. It probably won't exist when you retire. You're going to have to create your own wealth and retire on your own funds. Anything beyond that's bonus. I was like, okay, I don't even know what that means, but noted. And it's, and it's becoming only more likely and true every day. Um, the other thing they taught me is before I was born, they bought a 10 unit apartment building. And so even though my parents made a very modest annual income, um, they, you know, took significant risk to, to put a you know, down payment on the apartment building and then slowly built, you know, equity and cash flow till my dad bought my, my mom out. And then my dad eventually sold the building after 35 years and had this amazing cash out he could have never done unless he was, say, an entrepreneur or a business owner. Um, so they told me real estate is the, is the way out. And none of my mom and my dad were not entrepreneurs. My mom's side was entrepreneurs. My dad's side was not. So I ended up be going the route of entrepreneur. I didn't know it until later in life, but the real estate advice I got from them has proven, uh, even though I've proven you can also lose money in real estate, it has been largely, um, it's a majority of my investment, um, practice and my future planning for retirement passive income. Do you know what prompted them to get the real estate? Yes. My uncle, who has since passed away, it was kind of like my, he's my, my dad's cousin. He was more of like a brother to my dad than my dad's actual brother. Um, but he bought his first apartment building in Seattle while he was going to University of Washington. So he was a college student. And here's the best reason why he bought it, Rocky. He would kept going into a, uh, he worked at a, um, at a hardware store and these um, Italian gentlemen in beautiful suits would come in and ask and order washers and sink parts. And he's like, sorry to ask, but you guys are dressed really nicely and you're buying this, you know, heart, you know, basically hardware for sinks and dishwashers and whatever. Right. It's like, what's, can I ask what the deal is? Oh yeah, we own property. You know, we have rentals. And so these guys, he, he's not sure this day whether they were mob or not, but they were definitely real estate operators that were dressed amazing. So not only did my uncle start dressing in suits every day at University of Washington, he put money together with friends and, and with his family and bought a five unit apartment in college and then had a heavy that have a heavy, heavy impact on my mom. Uh, sorry, on my dad and my mom's side actually were also were entrepreneurs and had some real estate. So my mom and dad came together and were like, we better do this, um, even though they didn't have a lot of money. Nice. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing it's what real estate can do to your portfolio. But, but it, it, and this is where I think right. people get confused. It's a, it's long, a long game, game right? Right. Once it's paid yes. off, that is really where it starts to take off and, and have tremendous value. Right. Um, well, I will say one side note that my uncle, who parlayed that into a 10-unit building, a pigeonhole apartment by the Seattle Center, which was very prime, prime real estate. It had a pool in it. It was really cool. He spent almost every other weekend, you know, repairing, you know, apartment. It, maybe, I'm sorry, it was a 20-unit apartment. Um, so that years later carried the note, made, you know, a lot of extra additional money for years more without all the headaches. But my point is this, during the eighties, there was a massive recession in Seattle as well as there were early eighties or whenever that was. And everybody that got more than 30 units, he had friends that had two to 300, 400 units. They all went bankrupt. So to your side of, you can go too big or you can go too fast or you could be too leveraged. And he refused to do, he was heavily leveraged in college in the first couple of years of his life. Um, later in life, side note, 
because you can also, your own residence can become a major investment asset. He sold a beach house and every other asset he had to buy into a certain place in, in Seattle that had, you know, waterfront. And he paid $300,000 in the 80s. And since he passed away, it's now in the market for $6 million. So he, he waited 10 years to get into that area because it was such limited real estate. And so he said, I've been willing to sell everything multiple times to get the right piece of art, the right whatever, but usually real estate. Mm. So that, that, in fact, that impacted me. And if you look back at that period from the 80s to today, we had a very strong headwind of a, a Fed that lowered rates and did a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know what the future is. I mean, you can't tell, but the headwinds are gone. <laughs> and I don't know if we'll have, uh, or I should say the tailwinds are, are gone. I don't know if we're going to hit headwinds going forward or if that will continue to be uh, possible going forward. Yeah, I mean, we'll see if, um, you know, uh, there's potential changes in the cap gains and other things, you know, and the interest income or expense, I mean. And I am not the kind of, I'm not a cap rate guy. I literally, you know, owner operator, owner occupy. I'm not buying investment properties on the commercial side. My only investment in owner occupied building is not going well since COVID. Um, you know, I've, I've sold two houses at a loss, um, but over the years, but in general, I'm certainly up, but you know, you can lose. But the main reason I like investing in real estate is it ties up your cash so you don't spend it on dumb stuff. And the odds <laughs> that your real estate goes down is relatively slim, depending on where you buy and when you buy, of course. But if you're in a high growth market, it's really hard to lose. So, you know, and I don't even care so much about the interest income, whether it's because I'm paying it off or not. It's, it's I want to tie my cash up in things that are hard for me, frankly, for discipline, not to go buy an extra Ferrari that I don't need, but certainly want. <laughs> Although those could be arguably investments, but we won't go into that. They can be, but you can't drive them then. That's actually, you're right. Just like collectible sneakers. And unfortunately right. for me, bourbon, that's another one. You know, it's funny with real estate compared to the stock market. So when real estate gets expensive, people aren't flocking to buy it. When stocks get expensive, people start flocking to buy them. And when, when real estate, real estate drops, drops, everyone's like, I'm not, I'm not selling, selling for that, that price. price. But when, but when stocks, stocks drop, they do people sell them. Right <laughs> That's a really and good point. It, it's it's a very weird kind of um, human nature type of thing. And yeah, real estate, basically what you're doing is you're slowly building wealth. And because it's not easy to sell real estate, meaning you can't just put in a sell order, you, you have to go through a process. Um, People tend to be a little bit slower with it. And like you said, it's cool that you've understood how you behave with money mm -hmm. and then investing in ways that kind of limit you or control your behaviors. Right. And I just recently, I don't know if you read the article, I listened to it in the car on this, this weekend on New York Times about FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early Movement. I'm sure you have thoughts on it. I, if I'm a FIRE, I'm a fat FIRE. Like I am not going to eat beans and surf, couch, couch surf to retire early. And if I, I think you and I are similar in that, and my entrepreneurial friends, we could all retire tomorrow if we move to Thailand or some really affordable place in Mexico or something, sell everything and buy a nice little place. We, we could do that. But um, I have a strong belief personally, as much as I like what some of the fire movement is trying to say is, one of the guys went back to work because he lost meaning and purpose, right? He lost focus. So that's why I believe at 52, I am at my highest earning potential because I have the most knowledge and the most energy and the biggest network. And, and it's actually peaking. It's starting to deteriorate, right? I'm starting to coast. Well, I would say this because I don't intend to be cutting edge digital marketer for another 10 to 20 years. I'm, I'm glide pathing on that. But what I'm focusing on, we'll talk about later, is my my newfound passion as a recent employee for the first time after 22 years of the employee engagement, employee retention, the employee journey. What does all that mean? As, a, as, as an entrepreneur talking to other entrepreneurs, I feel that we all underestimate 
our problems and the source is our lack of attention to our employees, that we make assumptions about that they're happy or we don't care or whatever it is. And suddenly the cost of replacing people, the cost of recruiting, the cost of managing unhappy, unproductive people gets, it kills your entire margin. It can kill your business. So that's my new passion. And we're going to talk about that. And you are absolutely right. Not having good people really kills the business. I am a big fan of, of the FIRE movement, but I was part of the FIRE movement over 20 plus years ago, 25 years before they called it FIRE. Before it was right? okay. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was, I forget. I used to listen to a guy um, who was doing investment advice. His name was Bob Brinker. And he would talk about, um, I think it was terminal velocity. It was, it was basically, now, mind you, this was a long time ago, right? It's 25 years ago plus. He's like, if you can get $2 million in the bank, you've achieved what he called terminal velocity, which means you could pay all your expenses and you could live life and, and life was now totally on your terms. That yeah. two million is definitely a much higher number today. And I'm with you. I'm big into the fat fire group. But here's the thing that I've really noticed. Most of the people in these groups, at least people like us, it's financial independence. Retirement is not on their list, but it's I'm going to do what I love yes. and I'm going to live life the way I want to. And you'll still be doing things that bring economic value to you. So you still make money, but you make it on your terms where you can just say, no, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing that. No, no, we're not doing that either. You live on, on your goals. And, and that to me is much more important I've also noticed that people who are active are vibrant. And I, that's the biggest way to tell the difference between somebody who is retired and active is how they look when they're in their 70s. You make a good point. And if I were to modify the fire movement, I call it something more like Phil, financial independence, love life. So love life means you and I are working based on a definition, whether it's a W-2, 1099, contract, labor, whatever it is, but we, it doesn't feel like work, right? Mm -hmm. It's fun. What you're doing right now is fun. You're educating people on financial independence. Um, you know, it's, it's, and to me, speaking, writing, being a thought leader on digital marketing, employee journey, whatever it is, isn't work to me. It's fun. And if I can, if I can offset that with income from speaking and try, you know, offset my travel and travel the world, well, spreading the gospel, that's just a dream come true. That's not work. You know, I could do that till I can't. Well, even after I can't walk, if I can get a wheelchair onto a plane, I'm still going, you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I 100 percent agree with you. And I am very much there with you. So, so you go to college, right? You got out and then you followed an entrepreneurial journey. Is that what happened? Yeah. So um, side note, because my, my grandparents on my mom's side were entrepreneurs, my grandfather out of Seattle was one of eight children, eight sons, eight sons. And they, none of them ever had a W-2. They were all independent um, entrepreneurs that I think there were 25 patents among the eight brothers. And so they did the classic move that one of my landlords did, which was you buy a business, you get the building, you build the business, sell the business, keep the building. So they ended up selling their business, keeping the building near what used to be the kingdom, now Safeco Field. And they, they lived off of the building income um, until they, re, you know, like went into assisted living. And then my mom helped them sell the building, you know, grow their portfolio, all that. But it was the building selling the business got them some income, but it was the residual of that passive income of a, a giant, you know, commercial um, location did them well. So I, I saw that and I was like, I want to do something like that. But my mom, since I was selling Jolly Ranchers to my fellow students in high school for a, you know, hundred percent markup, since I was the top seller at all our garage sales, selling all my stuff and other people's stuff, I, my mom said, you're a natural business. Starting when I was maybe at 10, she started saying that. I was like, I don't even know what that means. But once, by the time I got into business school up in uh, at Western Washington University in Bellingham, I was like, oh, I guess this is my thing. My favorite class was my sales class. 
You know, like I enjoyed selling. Then I got all these, I had to take all these stupid math classes, you know, finance, accounting, calculus twice. You get my drift. But that has helped me in business to not be afraid of a P&L. I don't love numbers. I can hire a good CPA. But my point is not knowing those numbers is deadly to an entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs, as you know, and, and evangelize the E-Myth, you work in the business, not on the business, which means you can't grow the business. I have an article I wrote, the, the, the E-Myth myth, which is um, if you solely work on the business, success. If you don't work in the business and only work on the business, great. That did not work for me. In digital marketing, where I was hiring talent and training them, and there were no degrees, um, the more I got away from the business, and we can talk about EO in a second, because I, it's full of great people, great knowledge, great tools. And I've been a member of EO Entrepreneur Organization since 07. And even though my business was sold two years ago, I'm still in EO. I find that much value as an independent sort of consultant, semi-retired, whatever you want to call it. Um, but when I heard about the e-myth, I was like, oh my God, work on the business, on the business, on the business. And I, I got detached from the digital, the digital dark arts. I got detached from my team. I got detached from my clients. And a couple of years later, I paid a really high price for that. Now, I did, that, that is anybody, you know, the guy that wrote the e-myth would say, you didn't follow all of our tenants. Fair enough. But I had to write an article, felt obligated to say there's more to it. You still have to stay in the business enough to know why you're there and why your employees are there and why your clients are there. Um, and I lost track of that because I was busy, you know, looking at numbers and going to retreats and doing whatever. And so I, I lost my way. And in 2013, so I, I founded my agency in 2000. And the first lesson in entrepreneurial journey was having gotten into the digital market, into the PR world as, a, as an agency guy in 94. I, w I had five jobs in five years before I founded my agency. In fact, I co-founded an agency in 99, but by the fall of 2000, I, I was fired from that part of ways and said, I better do my own thing. But I wasn't ready to hire people. So I started another agency with another friend of mine and then decided, oh, I don't want to do it here, but hiring people isn't scary. So then by fall of 03, I started hiring employees at my own agency. So even though Anvil was 22 years old, I had um, employees full-time for like tw uh, 19 of those years. And I loved and hated my employees. I blew the company up in 2013 because of that and started rebuilding it from being client-centric to employee-centric. And by 2022, I was able to exit at a decent number. The M&A experience is a total conversation for another day. Um, but I would say, just mentioning e um, EO one more time is, um, tools like EOS, I see you've got Profit First in, behind you, and you're a big tenant of that. I, 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 but I, just, I took bits and pieces from that and Gazelle, Strategic Coach, and I put it into what I felt worked best for a knowledge business, um, a service business like an agency. Not all, particularly EOS is great for like a manufacturer, blue collar, it's not great for white collar, so I had to modify it. Um, but collectively, all the tools and traction and all these great scaling up, like I just took what I liked best and, I, and, it, and it helped me turbocharge my business at best. At worst, it helped me save my business from certainly we were on the rocks. We were done. And I took it out and built it back with help. And I know for many business owners, that's the struggle is employees. And the funny thing is employees have no idea how much trouble they make for the business owner. Um, and they have a different mindset and there's nothing wrong with it. I've been on both sides of the table. I get it. Um, and I think part of the problem with being an employee is you don't get to say, I'm going to do what I love necessarily, right? Because if the job says you have to do this, most employers are not, they're not in tune to say, wait a minute. This guy's really good at these three things and he loves doing them. Let him go do those three and let's find somebody else to do the other two that he was supposed to who loves those. And that's a big part that comes out of traction is, is right people with the capability and the desire to do the job. And I think those are the things we forget to ask. And that's a big part of what we're going to talk about. So, so you sold, sold out, out, and is that is when that you when became an employee? employee? Yeah, so I went in March of 22, I sold to a Midwest-based agency, also an EO, and I became the chief marketing officer. And I was basically, 
you know, first six months transitioning my team and my clients over. And that agency did a fantastic job of getting my clients into to a happy place, far better than I could have ever imagined. Um, and then I was able for the next, what I thought was going to be years, but ended up being the next, say, um, eight months was building out their marketing. They had never really had internal marketing as an agency or external marketing because they were always doing it for their clients. So I built out their marketing and, you know, social and helped support their sales pipeline and sales team. And I was, I was getting in that groove and then they hit some financial um, challenges and had to make some cuts. And eventually I was one of those. They closed my office here in Portland. Um, the team went remote. Um, there was some turnover, uh, particularly on my team, which broke my heart, frankly. But um, what I learned, even just that first day of being an employee was like, oh, I kind of get it now. The matrix, right? I, I took the blue pill and I understood like, now that I'm actually employed where I could, even though I'm on the leadership team and I'm a significant shareholder, of this new, you know, this entity, I felt like I definitely don't have control and it changed my view of everything, right? I couldn't help it. I suddenly instantly went to uh, employee, but the entrepreneur in me said, oh my gosh, I want to fix this. I took seven pages of notes over that 14 months on things that could be done better. And I would say 100% applies to any company, but you know, all of it may only apply to a very small subset of businesses, right? But but my I learned, I was like, oh my gosh, what would it take to make me, I was committed to being the best employee ever and I failed apparently. So what would it take to get me to become a, the best employee? So that's when I started this, this um, fascination with employee experience, employee engagement, employee retention. I'll give you a little side note that based on what you just said, the most satisfied employees, and there's an HBR article about this, are employees of corporate, you know, full-time gig, but they also have a gig economy side side hustle. So because of what you said with scaling up and traction is we all need purpose. And the odds of us finding purpose in a company we do not own or not a controlling shareholder over is near zero. There are a few exceptions. So the way to fulfill that deeper purpose is having a side hustle that gives you that fills the rest of that, that that bucket. But you fill your financial bucket and your stability and your healthcare and some other social needs and whatever it is through your core job. But that critical side hustle gives, it's like 40, it's like the highest percent satisfaction over even just pure gig workers and over pure, you know, any other type of business, um, any, any other type of employment. So it supports well, what you're saying. And I and thought... I thought it might be Google who does this. They they give people like a day a week to work on what they want to work on. And That's they can true. go experiment it's... and play. Yep. Would that also satisfy that same thing while possibly creating even more business for the business owner? Yeah, I think they call it like quantum labs or skunk. Or I don't know what it is, but you're right. It's 20% of their time. They're encouraged to go do something radical. And that's how they got Gmail and all these other great yeah, maybe even Google Maps. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, you should Google, uh, Google, Google about um, their 20 percent. Um, but I think it's something like quantum. And so that I would say would be a very close replacement, if not an entire, you know, example of that's effectively a gig economy thing. They get to pursue what they want within such broad ramifications that I think it's it's nearly bomb proof, you know, as an idea. Very few companies are willing to do that. And very few have the you know, financial cushion like a Google to pull that off. But they have benefited hugely into the billions of dollars from just one or two of these things going big. So, so how, how, I mean, I let's, mean face let's face it. it. Today, today, people are like, I'm working so much. I got to take care of kids. I got this. How are they going to add this up to their day to do that side business too? So, you know, I was literally thinking about that this weekend because thinking about my son, who's a entrepreneurial mindset, very math minded, unlike me, his younger brother is the opposite, very creative, very messy. Um, they could both be entrepreneurs. But, you know, my oldest son, who's now a freshman in college is, you know, looking at he was looking at career hacks. And he's like, an anesthesiologist has the least amount of higher education and the highest pay per minute. You know what I mean? So he was looking at that. Um, he also has done his amount of, of betting, you know, sports betting, because he does all the reading and is really good at statistics and has done largely well. You know, he's well ahead. Now, is that sustainable? No. Am I encouraging that as an outcome? Like, no. But I would say parlay that into get involved in an app, 
that's, you know, in that space or a company that's in that space. So you can have a steady paycheck and still do what you love. But I believe that the shortest answer to the early retirement or safe income is, is really to be an entrepreneur and, and do something to the fills a need and do it on your terms and do it in a way that makes you money. And, um, and you know, very few people do that. Uh, you and I are, are in that era, but we, you don't have to go, you don't have to have 10 million in revenue. And in fact, when you talked about that old idea of once you get to 2 million, you're done, you know, millionaire today is, has to have eight of versus 1965 has to have about 8 million in the bank. That's the equivalent, right? Well, I had a friend of mine in EO tell me, he's like, once I get to that 30 million, like um, if, if I exit or whatever, however he gets, he's like, my target's 30 million, then I'm done. So that's a really large fat, super fat buyer. Other people in the article were, once they hit a million, they were done because they figured I can live on 50 grand a year. And I assume they must have their house paid for and then they're done. But you know, that's real thin living. 30 million, I was like, listen, you only need 5 million um, to retire and not even an interest in real estate, right? Passive income. What can a $5 million property give you? Like 10 to $20,000 a month. And that's more than interest than you get. You'll never get that much interest. You do need 30 million to get that kind of interest or whatever it is. I'm not great at math, as I said. So (laughs) real estate, passive income earning in real estate or equivalent is what gets you there faster than money sitting in a low interest bearing account or even a high interest bearing account. That's true. That's true. And, and, and I think I, people, people people don't realize the concept of yes, yes end. end. So, so yes, yes end, end, I'm going to have some money in a CD, yep. yes, and yep. some in the stock market, yes, and some in real estate, and yes, and some in running my business. Mm-hmm. And together, they all weave their way through. And yeah. overall, you end up with enough to, to do that. So through this journey of being an employee, what is it? What are the strategies or ideas that you learned from that yes. to do a better job of retaining and also, uh, I don't want to motivate them per se, because it's really hard to motivate people. You got to do it every single day, like getting them self-motivated to want to work with you or in that business. Yeah, so I'll speak uh, from my pure background of ex- my own experience share, but I will also say that there's it's backed with a bunch of science and statistics. So for starters, one thing that I think I was doing right, but it was not foolproof, uh, but the few things I did right at Anvil that um, I wanted to carry over to my new employer, and they took bits and parts of it. But one is I met with every employee once a month between 15 and 30 minutes, depending if they were just um, at a junior level or a direct report, I'd spend longer with them. But it was like, if it was sunny or not raining, we'd walk so that the energy was pointed together the same direction instead of at each other. Some people, it's too intense, especially in Portland, we're a very passive aggressive culture and people don't like to look at each other and talk intensely. How's life? How's work? You know, any big wins, any stucks? That's, you know, very few, none of my previous employers did I have any regular meeting time with leadership or ownership ever. Um, I don't think my team appreciated as much as they should have, but it was still the right move and it can be done even better than I did it. Number two is an employee roadmap. We call it an IDP or individual development plan. And IDP is basically, um, here is your fit within our organization for the life of your career here. And and it maps to what we need from you, but also what you need from us. And that second part is what I didn't focus on enough. And that's what I'd focus on more this time. Um, so give you an example. Ten years ago, I had a gal that wanted to start a restaurant. And I just sort of gave her the advice from my friends. We had a bunch of hospitality clients over the years. The best way to, to make a small fortune in the restaurant industry is start with a large fortune. And so I, you know, I didn't want to crush her dreams. I said, well, okay, how do we get from you being an account manager to you being a restaurateur without discouraging her or losing our clients was let's go out together and go uh, win some uh, restaurant client or two that you can work on and you'll just get closer to the business while you're doing your work. And she's like, great. Well, she ended up quitting a a month or two later to move with her husband to somewhere. We didn't get to do that, but that's a creative way to map her long-term goals to while she was there today at AMBA, what can we do? Um, so trans- translating that into my my role as an employee, I was like, where's my roadmap? Oh, no, we don't have a roadmap for you. Um, 
we have accountabilities because we were ELS. I'm like, well, I don't even agree with these accountabilities. So I, it took me a couple months to back and forth to where we agreed on even remotely on what my accountabilities were. So let's let's talk talk about this because this is one that I I think think really really causes causes trouble. trouble. You're accountable accountable for doing doing this, this, but you have no authority authority to get it done. done. Accountability without authority, right? It's a pipe dream. And, and you're exactly right. That's, that's kind of what I, and also there was a little that they actually gave me a reasonable amount of authority, but what they gave me is sales. And I am not, I'm, even though I can kill sailing and I did all my, my whole career on my terms for my company, I didn't want to do it for them because I didn't even agree who their audience was and how to go after them and what service to provide at what price point. There was so much disconnect. I was like, I am not comfortable giving, being in part of an SQL, sales qualified lead. I'm happy to give you MQLs, but even then I fear that they're not going to convert because the people that I know who to sell to are not who you want to sell to. So there, but your point is taken. Oftentimes it, it is the a responsibility or accountability without the authority or autonomy. And that's what I felt. I, you know, they gave me all kinds of space on things I didn't care about and no space on the things I did. And just to keep it vague. And that was di- disheartening to me. Also, just simple things. I always celebrated wins. And I even learned there are people that don't want public accolades. They only want private at most. And others that if you don't give them the public accolades, they will go off and start cutting themselves. So you have to balance individual needs, right? Well, I was barely getting any accolades for crushing it. And I was getting a lot of criticism for not doing things that I didn't even know about or care about or wasn't good at. And I was like, this isn't going to work, right? I never did that with my employees. You know, beat them up and down and left and right about things that they weren't aware of or weren't good at or, you know, weren't, you know, wasn't part of their core uh, accountabilities. So I didn't expect that from anybody else. But I will say there's two things that I've added. One thing I added right before we sold was moving from annual to quarterly reviews because you cannot correct behavior on a quarterly basis. Can you imagine only talking to your husband, wife, girlfriend, or boyfriend once a year about how the relationship is going and and how to make it better? That's ridiculous. So how do you um, do that once a year in in your career? So we move to quarterly reviews and only once a year we do full 360 from client feedback and vendors and teammates, but the otherwise it's core team members at a quarterly basis. How are they doing? Are they hitting their goals? So that was one thing I added, but the the, the one thing I didn't add that I think is mission critical um, is the stay interview. So, you know, you can read about it. You've probably heard about it, but very few of my entrepreneur friends are doing stay interviews. I recommend that if you're going to do quarterly interviews, you do a stay interview at least half the time. So every six months, there should be a stay interview and there should be elements of it every quarter, if not built into every meeting, um, is how are you doing and how can we help you do better? But on a stay interview, it's you know, stop, start, continue. What are we doing that you love and appreciate? You want to make sure we keep doing. What are we doing that you you would prefer we never do again? And what do we need to start doing that we're not doing to keep you engaged and happy and fruitful? These are questions that nobody has ever asked me. And so the side story there, Rocky, is that I presented this workshop, my culture of caring workshop, which you can find on my PDX Mindshare webinar channel. Um, I did a one hour, 90 minute workshop or so. And I, I told them about the stay interview. At this time now, pdxmindshare.com, I have a stay interview ro- you know, roadmap, um, just short of a script. But this guy that organized the group for me, it's an EO chapter, a forum. Uh, forum. The, he had 50 employees. The next day, I didn't know he was going to do this. He just apparently wrote one thing down, stay interviews. He went to his top two employees and had stay interviews the next day. Uh, two days later, he emails me. He said, yesterday, after, you know, I and appreciate your presentation. The next day I had stay interviews with my two top employees. He said it transformed their relationship permanently. Like it was, tra- it just, they, they looked at each other different. There was a new level of understanding. If you think about it, it makes total sense because if Rocky, you're constantly interviewing, you're reviewing me and you're beating me up in some accolades, but it's a one-way conversation that gets old. And, but if you're like, let's make this two area. Now it's you to tell me you know, can't tell, tell me, Rocky, what we can do better than suddenly I'm like, you appreciate me. And it's really all about acknowledging I exist, that I matter, that I can make an impact and show me what that impact is and how to get there. That's really all this is. And so few people do it. So, so when, when I was in corporate, we, we they did we used to do the start, start stop, stop, and continue, continue stuff. stuff. The, problem the problem is, is 
What I found more often than not in corporate is they didn't actually want to hear the answers. Exactly right. They wanted to do the exercise and they check, they check listened to what you said, but then they're like, oh, we, we can't stop doing that. And we can't start doing that. And thank you for your feedback. Okay, now back to the whipping. <laughs> right. And so that, um, you know, you make a good point. And I think that if a company is not willing to make change, they shouldn't do a stay interview because that will just backfire. I, I poured my heart out. I took a risk. Now I feel like I'm exposed. And I, you're not only are not doing anything, I feel is disrespectful to me, or I might get in trouble, right? So if they come in with a, let's try to make fixes, I, I couldn't believe how many fixes I made to my business because my employees came up with better ideas than I had, right? And that's what it's all about, right? Listening and making changes to make it better. And, and I am a big fan of that. I think that especially frontline workers, they are the ones who know what's actually happening. But more often than not, the, the business owner will pay five grand to have a consultant come in, but he won't spend five minutes to listen to what the frontline worker is saying. And they're the people who know where all the waste is. They know what processes aren't working. Again, Again, you have to create create the culture culture that allows allows that that communication to take take place. place. But But you can get it all for free. You don't have to hire hire a consultant. consultant. And more More often than than not, the consultants consultants really don't don't understand understand your business. They've got a framework framework that they claim claim works. works, And now they want to mold you to their framework, not mold their framework to you and make it work. And it... Yeah, yeah, that that's, that's, the, that's world the world of corporate. Of corporate. And it is. I, think, I think, but small but business, business owners haven't experienced this stuff. And so they're, and so they're not, not even aware, aware of all of these things that can be done. done. And, and honestly, honestly, when you're talking about going, going back, back to the frontline front worker, worker, that was, that the, was the whole concept, concept that came out of how Japan changed the auto industry. And I think that came out of, I don't know, it didn't come out of the book, the goal which is a really, really old mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they changed the way they talk to the frontline factory worker. And the whole communication concept was different. And they actually supported them for stopping the line and saying, how can we support you instead of this battle all the time? And I think that's the problem we have. We go into everything as a battle instead of realizing, hey, we're all on the same side. And at the end of the day, if employees make the company profitable, then the company can keep paying them. I think a lot of employees have a disconnect between, you know, who's actually paying their paycheck, which is the client. And if you're not serving the client well, you're in trouble. And I can't tell you how many businesses I've walked into where that frontline worker is the reason I no longer do business with them. Well, you make a really good um, point that I want to um, hit on, and that is that these, um, when you talk about um, companies making adjustments and listening, it's kind of remarkable that J- Japan was listening to their workers when they have a culture of hierarchy there that's so inflexible that their pilots were flying into mountains, literally. So they had to change the way pilot training worked. They had to change the culture of certain, you know, could be in Asia, could be other places, but where the pilot had the last call, the captain. If the captain was wrong, they all died, right? So they had to educate, um, in, you know, the second in command, you know, um, or others to call in question. And the, and the pilot had, the captain had to acknowledge, I hear you and I'm considering what you're saying. So it's a really interesting that Japan would have, re- re- to, for them to revolutionize the auto industry by letting the employees share a voice and, a, and, a, and, and be valued, that's remarkable. And it shows, again, what the potential, like you said, the people in the front line. So I listened, you know, I was doing net promoter score surveys. I had to modify NPS. I had to modify elements of EOS. I found that EOS is very blue collar focused. It's very transactional. It's very beneficial to the entrepreneur owner and not to the employees. Um, and, you know, the work I, the research I've done with Tiffany Bova, who's remarkable uh, around employee experience, she wrote a book about it. Um, she was my inspiration. Is that um, 
in company corporate calls, you're talking about big corporate America and the Fortune 1000, Fortune 5000s, on their core, quarterly earning calls, they associate the term employee with a problem, not a solution. And that's a profound disconnect, right? If your employees are your problem, I used to say jokingly until I sold my agency, running an agency is the easiest business in the world if I didn't have to deal with employees and clients, right? Just so easy, right? Um, and now I look at it. So to give you the light twist on what I was doing and my insight from 2019, I thought I was selling in, in March of 19, I had a sale agreement on the table, done deal. And I backed out because of some advice from a friend said, you're not ready. I was like, and they're not a great fit or whatever the case was. He was right. And then I laser focused on, I'm going to take care of my employees. They'll take care of the clients. The clients will take care of me. Right. And that's the um, Southwest Airlines model. Leadership takes care of employees, employees take care of the customers, the customers keep flying with Southwest. Minus their technology issues, they still have that really high NPS score. And so that's what keeps people coming back. I had it backwards. I was like, I focus on making sure that client, client experience is world class, that the employees support that experience, and then it'll all pencil out. The problem was that, as Tiffany Bova proved, investing in customer experience does not have a direct correlation with profitability like investing in your employees does. That's a proven correlation. So I started to change the way I looked at everything after you know reading and looking at her stuff. Can you, Can you just, just touch, touch on, on and explain, explain what the, the, the net promoter score is? Yeah, so net promoter score, and you can Google it. I think there's a great article on HBR, maybe Wired uh, or whatever. But net promoter score is oversimplifying is the biggest complaint. Uh, predictively, how your business is going to perform based on how many promoters you have of your business minus the detractors. So it's two questions. One, zero to 10, how likely are you to refer us to a friend? And, two, and number two is why? The one is simply a nine or a 10 are promoters, subtract six, zero through six as detractors, and you come up with a score. Um, I think utilities have a negative score. Um, airlines have, uh, you know, like between, you know, like 20, the 20s, but, but Southwest has an 85 score. My company was between, a, uh, at its lowest, like a 45, its highest of 85. As I went through a rebuild, we went from down, down to a 45 from a 65 and up back up to an 85. So it was hard earned. But the idea is that if we know you have a high score, that it does predict lightly, like how sticky your clients are, how likely they are to tell others. Um, um, I felt it was too simple in the service business because it's not the widget isn't the whole experience. So it's I broke it down into questions like um, our ability to deliver, our knowledge of your industry or your, or your business, um, the associated value of what we um, provide, and I'm probably missing one thing, uh, relevance of our service offering to their needs, something like that. So I could separate, really, I want to separate my subject matter experts on my digital marketing team from the account team, from our pricing, you know, and, and try to figure out what the correlations were with how long they were a client, how much they were spending, the kind of client they were by industry, and I'd slice and dice all that data. So I took the NPSI data and I really customized it. But that way I could separate out who my best account people were and who needed help, who my best subject matter experts were, and if they needed to be celebrated and appreciated, or if they needed more profit development, et cetera. Um, and which clients were happy, those were my authentic te te testimonials. And anything under a, se a seven or an eight, I immediately had a coffee or a meeting with them to figure out what's wrong. How do we fix this? And if they went, I don't know what you're talking about, then why wouldn't you give me a nine or a 10? What do I need to get to do that? And then they would talk it through and realize, well, actually, there was a reason. And we fixed it. And then they stay. If we didn't fix it, they leave. And that's the beauty of NPS. Nice. nice. Now, yeah, one of the one things of the I've things always I've talked, talked about, about is, is that, that um, you have you to have hire the culture. culture. You can yes. always train employees. But if you don't hire to culture, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Uh, that's 100% right. So, and my little story, side story there is I mentioned that I uh, rebuilt the business in 13. I, I straight up blew it up. And I didn't want to go to work. And you can Google Jerry Maguire moment, Kent Lewis. It's still out there, a business journal article. But basically, I was staring at the ceiling next to my eight year old son at the time, going, while well, he's falling asleep, I'm like, I don't even want to go to work tomorrow. I was frustrated with my clients. I was PO'd at my team. I was, you know, out of touch with the industry. I was ready to quit, but I couldn't. It was my business. So that night I stayed up till 1 a.m. and wrote the credo, the Anvil credo. You can Google that as well. 
is really just 10 truths that would get me to go to work. And I turned those 10 truths into hiring criteria and said, everybody at Anvil, you need to sign a document that's basically the credo and say, I'm in it. I get it. Accountability. It's not about your job title. Um, all of these things. And, and half my team left. And then within 12 months, the rest of the team left. Um, but while it became a magnet and repelled my most of my existing team, I don't blame them because they had no accountability until I came up with the credo. And they decided I, I like not having accountability. And I say that both tongue in cheek and is true because there was no reason for them to leave if, uh, because everybody that came in, it, the magnet attracted new people. And they're like, I don't understand why people would leave. This is These are table stakes. These are not things that you should ever leave a company for um, unless you literally had it just easy peasy. And I'm, you know, welcome any of my, the former employees from 2013 or earlier to post comments on your podcast. But the reality is that um, I changed the game. They didn't like the new rules and that's fair, but I needed new people to help me build the business into a profitable entity. And those new people did that. Nice. nice. And, and and it takes, it takes courage, courage to do what you did because, as you said, you had a high level of turnover. I've got to believe they weren't um, smooth times, is what shall we call them? Well, it's funny you say that because 2011 was a record year. I had two agencies at that point. For five years, I had a second agency focused on small business, while Anvil grew to large business. You know, Fortune. We'll call it Fortune 1000, but it wasn't even that big. But it was it was the Lexus brand, and I decided I want to come in for the a Skyon brand because I was had been known as Toyota, and I was getting too premium. I, I had some really great brands and was moving my prices up, and I needed a way to help the small businesses that I also love. And so, so 2011, um, 2012, big revenue years, good strong profitability. We were working with Borders Books before they closed their doors, and um, and all of that. But um, what ended up happening is I wasn't recognizing what people were set the jargon at the conferences I was speaking at. I didn't even know what the head of Home Depot Interactive, the guy that ran their e-commerce and their digital marketing, I didn't even know what he was saying. It was like a foreign language. I'm like, I've been doing this longer than he has. Why do I, why do I not understand what he's saying? That was the working in the business versus on the business. I was out of touch. Secondarily, I came home from that conference in San Jose um, back in 2012 and my team's like, we just met with our Google rep for our quarterly. And they said, the way you guys are running your ads, you'll be out of business within two years. And I was like, well, that sounds about right. Because I'm out of touch. You're out of touch. We're all out of touch. Um, but it wasn't until later that I realized, well, I still have the money at least. But then I realized, well, there's this is going to burn into the ground. And I can do it stress-free and close it down in two years. Or I can rebuild it and make it valuable again. Um, and that's that whole idea of lifestyle business versus high multiple exit. And I have my own, it's not unique perspective. I have my own perspective on that. And it's simply this, whenever I came to a wine the road where I can either maximize the multiple or maintain a specific quality of life, unless it hurt me personally, I would go for the multiple, you know, more stringent contact uh, contracts, you know, more frequent customer check-ins, you know, other structure that maybe wasn't sexy to me personally. It wasn't a huge time suck, but it definitely tightened up our financials or it made us more attractive. So in the end, I don't feel like I really made a big sacrifice when I sold because I was running a lifestyle business, but I had dramatically increased the valuation, again, by focusing on the employee experience first, client spirit second, and then my own lifestyle for third. Well, and well, so let's and so just let's talk, talk about that. How do how business owners balance, balance that personal fulfillment with the idea of business growth? Because it seems like so many of them are focused on bigger, more, more, bigger, and yeah. that big number versus enjoying the journey. So um, that's so that's where the why in the road. I had, I've been at 10 agencies and and four, four to five times I ch ch crossed over what I believe was the chasm in agency, which was not 50 to 100 or 100 to 50, 500. It was 15 employees to 16 employees. No, actually it was 16 employees to 17 employees. So back when we started our agency in 1999, back even farther in 1995, I was a 12th employee. And when I left, they were 40 employees. And I was like, I was still having fun, but I was my first real full paying job. I didn't have any contacts. The second place I went, I was the 14th employee. They went to 20. I was like, this isn't as fun. Then I, when I started uh, co-founding an agency in 99, a year later, I remember when we hired our 17th employee, I remember that day because it was no longer fun. So when I when I designed Anvil, 
I designed the office for 16 employees so that it would force us to do something radical in order to hire more than that. And because it was never fun for me, and guess what? We did hire 17 twice for a hot minute. It wasn't fun the next day. So that was from my personal experience. They say Gore has figured, you know, perfected Gore Industries. The, the village is 150 people. After that, you lose that sense of village. And they build a new building for 150 people each time. For me, it's 15. And so to your point, the magic number in agency for valuation is 10 million minimum in, in billings. And I, w I never was more than a little more than three at my best combined year, but really it's more around two and one and five half to two. And guess what? I kept a lot of that in the bank because I ran a tight ship and I had a great lifestyle business. But I would say in the other way to look at, no matter what your business is, entrepreneurs, once they get to 30 to 50 employees, they can easily hire a COO and step back from day to day. So you either have it so small that it doesn't even need a GM or, you know, like five people, or you got to go to 50, right? And once you're at 500, you're just on the board and you're done, right? Um, but, you know, so I chose to be at 15 and be hands-on because I realized my happy place was staying up on it. As a thought leader, I need to stay up on it. So a little modified e-myth, basically. And, and at the end of the day, you have to find what works for you, right? You have to yes. define what works for you, figure it out, and go do it on your terms. I think too often we chase other people mm -hmm. instead of, of doing that for what we truly want. And that's part of the issue sometimes in being some of these groups, you get a little too excited <laughs> and you got to, you know, 100%, 100%. be in tune with who you want to be. Yes, that's exactly right. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Abundant life. Um, I would say it's, it's all about attitude. It's all about context. So if you wake up and I'm a low empath, right? And I'm not, I just did, I'm doing meditation for just this month. I've never done it before. It's a little struggle for me. It's like exercising a new muscle, but every morning and as part of my, um, my meditation, I'm, you know, there's that reminder of gratitude. Like, what am I gratitude? What am I grateful for? And it's like, to me, abundance is I have my family. I have my friends. I have my health. I have some knowledge that I can turn into income. And I really shouldn't sweat the small stuff. Um, so to me, life of abundance is focus on what you have and not what you don't. Focus on what you can impact, not what you can't. What's within arm's reach, right? So I am, I am obsessed with the amount of money I've lost recent, in the last year and a half, two years. Um, and I keep redirecting myself to what I have because I'm, I'm always have a negative bias to keep me on my toes, but what it does, it can be, it can be disheartening. It can create undue stress. So abundance is like celebrate all the little things and enjoy the big things. Don't sweat the other stuff that is not directly hurting your health or endangering your family and friends, basically. And for most people listening, you know, we're living a first world life, so you've got a pretty abundant Yes. You know, it's, yeah. And I just think that entrepreneurs are drilled to like, always look at the, you know, the, this and the, that and the ups and the downs. And the way I look at it, it's like, come on, people, we can, we can do better. We should be grateful for every moment we have, you know, and because when you lose those people you care about or the ability to do certain things, you'll, 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 you'll always think twice. So true. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? Um, later in life. Um, it's funny cause I could say I didn't learn enough. Um, and I made the same mistakes in the last two years that I made 20 plus years ago in terms of, I've been fired now three times. Um, you think I'd get better at this. Um, I would say, um, to listen more and talk less. And I say that, and it's takes all my discipline on in every bone of my body. I love to talk. You have the gift of gab. Um, you're actually a great listener, but my point is I love to talk. That's why I was an adjunct for 20 years at Portland State University. That's why I'm an instructor for SCORE. I love sharing knowledge. I don't necessarily love talking. I love saying useful things. If I'm not saying something useful, my wife reminds me of that regularly, then I need to shut up. Um, <laughs> but I found when I've had the discipline to listen first before I speak, exponential impact. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? funny because that would be my son. Um, <laughs> you know, I would say, well, what I'm telling you, if they're in school, 
like he's a freshman in college is get every ounce of value out of this really expensive education, knowing that it is primarily, above all else, a social experiment, that you learn some things if you, if you pay attention. Um, so there's that. And also, don't, over, don't overweight or over-index on the power of an education, because as soon as I was done, I never talked about my GPA again because it was terrible, and it didn't matter at all, right? It does if you want to go into banking in New York City or Chicago or SF, but it doesn't in almost any other discipline. Um, the last thing is that your greatest path to an early success is, is to control your destiny through ownership or entrepreneurship or some other way. And as much as that kind of like it scares me, I wouldn't say jump right into it per se, but always be testing, test new ideas. You know, Edison failed a thousand times before he invented the light bulb. Most people don't have that patience. So stick with it. And surround yourself with people that bring you up, not suck suck the energy out of you. I didn't enjoy college, college, college very much either, either. and I didn't, I didn't have, have a great GPA, GPA and, and here I am kind of, kind of ahead of everyone, everyone who did, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> You've done good. You've done good. <laughs> if people would like to learn more about you, check out your articles and so forth, where can they find out more about you? Uh, best place to find me is at kentjlewis.com. That's kind of my professional site as a speaker and a thought leader. Articles webinars, where I'm speaking, what I'm writing about, uh, a little bit more about me, and links to some really helpful articles that also, some of those will be in the show notes. Um, and then you can follow me on uh, Twitter X at Kent J. Lewis as well, because I'm every hour um, during the during the week, I'm, I'm tweeting out something useful, primarily about digital marketing. Um, and then connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find Kent Lewis, Anvil, and I hope to see you online. Thank you, Thank so, you much so much for much joining us today. today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rocky. Thanks for checking out this unedited video of the Richer Soul podcast. You can find the full episode along with all the back episodes at richersoul.com. This podcast is brought to you by Profit Comes First, where we help business owners to have a more profitable and growing business so they can live the life of their dreams. Check that out as well wherever you listen to all this content.